very, very proud of everything the college does, the women's leadership, and of course we have a fantastic speaker today. But before I get started to introduce the exceptional woman who is introducing our exceptional speaker, uh, Dr. Baker, the director, the executive director of the Women's Leadership Institute just put something in my hand to not forget to thank the following people, which I am now dutifully doing, okay? So first of all, I want to thank Lily Ledbetter who spoke last year. There she is. She is back with us today. And October 1st of 2011, she was indicted, inducted. She was, I practice this, I swear, <laughs> into the National Women's Hall of Fame. So congratulations. <laughs> of course, I thank the Auburn University Board of Trustees, the Department of Theater for letting us use these beautiful facilities. Deidre Haig, the voice of the Women's Leadership Institute, uh, the Women's Leadership Institute Advisory Board, the College of Liberal Arts, our Student Eminent Society, and of course I want to mention that this lecture was made possible in part by a gift in honor of Bob and Michelle McGuinness. So, <laughs> this is a football weekend, so let me just do this. War Eagle! All right, Auburn University, a great university. When you come to any events at Auburn University, you are expecting quality. And this would never be possible if we weren't a great university with a great faculty and great staff. But the other side of the story is we have outstanding students. And of course, outstanding students turn into outstanding alumni. So we picked an outstanding alum to introduce our speaker, and her name is Melanie Barstead. And Melanie is an alum with a BA here from Auburn University. She's chairing the Women's Leadership Institute Advisory Board. She's a member on my advisory board and the Auburn Foundation Board of Trustees. And she has been an executive leader for more than 25 years with Johnson & Johnson. She now has her own consulting firm, Barstead & Associates and she has a true passion for women in leadership. She also is a perfect timer, and as of Tuesday next week, it will be announced that she was nominated and will be confirmed on Tuesday for her directorship, uh, director position on the board of Sintus, a Fortune 1000 company. And she is, or will be, to be perfectly correct, as of Tuesday, she will be the only woman serving on this board. So I am sure Melanie will kick some butt. Yeah. <laughs> so an outstanding alum will introduce our outstanding speaker. Please welcome my alum, colleague, and friend, Melanie Barstead. Thanks, Dean Gromberg. Uh, thank you for being here. It is always a pleasure to talk about uh, women's leadership, to come to Auburn, and uh, to be here with the Women's Leadership Institute, and especially to the Extraordinary Women's Lecture Series. Uh, today, we are extremely honored to have a truly extraordinary woman uh, to deliver our talk. And as the dean had asked me and Barbara had asked me to do the introductions today, uh, I stepped back and I wanted to think for a moment about what extraordinary means. And probably for a lot of you, you haven't really formulated a lot of thoughts about being extraordinary. Now maybe you have and maybe it's not something you put a list together, but uh, as I step back and I put myself in your shoes, and yes, at one time I was your age, um, I thought about what does extraordinary mean? And it clearly means going beyond what is usual, regular, or customary. And it means being exceptional to a marked degree. And what we try to do as an advisory board and at the Women's Leadership Institute under Barbara's and Paula's leadership 
as we try to bring people here to talk to you about how in the world did they become and how are they so extraordinary. I had the opportunity when I was with Johnson & Johnson to meet Marie Wilson and I was subbing for someone else so I was really lucky because I, I wasn't extraordinary at all. I was down the ladder but I got a chance to go and sit in on an advisory board of the White House project. And what did I know and what do I know about Marie Wilson? And we have a really neat opportunity today to hear from her. Who is she? She's an advocate for women and an advocate for women in leadership. And she's done that for over 30 years. And as I began to write down what do I know about her, what do I think about her, what have I heard about her, the words that came to mind were really powerful words. The words that came to mind were words like innovator, words like a change maker, not just a change agent, but a change maker. She made things happen. She's a visionary leader. She's politically savvy, and you'll hear a lot about that perhaps today. She's well networked. We hear a lot in women's leadership about being networked. She is extremely well networked. She's strategic, she's purposeful, and she's committed. She is an authority on women's leadership, and she's very, very well credentialed. So in thinking about that, what has she accomplished and what has she done with her life and with her career and with her passion? Well, she's founder and president emerita of the White House Project and the Ms. Foundation for Women. Now, as I sat down and did a little math, and this was rather sobering for me, because I think many of you were probably born in 1988, 89, 90, 91 maybe. She's the creator of Take Our Daughters and Now Sons to Work Day. How many of you participated in that opportunity to go with maybe a mother or a father or an aunt and uncle or someone to an office? Can I see some hands? Did any of you guys ever do any of that? I see some hands out there. Well, I'll tell you. Between 30 and 40 million people have been part of that program, and between three and four million companies today participate in that program. And she was the co-creator of that program. She's an author, and we have her books here today. She's extremely visible. She's been on the Today Show, Good Morning America, among just a few. She's been on CNN. She's certainly well published. You'll see her articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And she has clearly made a different to, difference to tens of thousands of women and men. I talked to her about her degrees, and she has several honorary doctorates. But the one she said she was most proud of was a recent honorary doctorate from the Episcopal Seminary in Boston, Massachusetts. And she says now she likes to say she's truly divine. <laughs> I think you'll agree when we hear her. Um, but She's also, I'd like to say, well-balanced. She is a mother of five. She is a grandmother of 10. She lives in New York City, but she's a native of Georgia. Please give a warm welcome to Marie Wilson. Thank you. And thank you for, um, is, the, is the mic good? Is it good? Okay, thank you for coming out on such a, uh, such a really nasty day. Uh, it really, I, they promised me sun and I almost went home, but I'm going to stay. Um, I wonder if there's any way I could see the people in the audience at all. I can see only dark. Is there a place where you can tape it and I can just see one person so I know that somebody's out there without saying, oh, thank you, you look lovely. Okay, um, I'm really delighted to be here for a lot of reasons. One is that I was here for the founding of the Women's Leadership Institute. I was here for the first time. They had a meeting and I wrote about the women of Alabama and the book, Closing the Leadership Gap. And uh, so I felt like I wanted to come back here. I leave for Italy tomorrow to do something, but my staff was like, don't you, don't go there. I said, no, I have to go because I got to see what happened. And it, it did happen well, so thank you. I'm glad to be here because I think that uh, 
I think Lily Ledbetter has done more for equality in this country than almost anybody in my lifetime through her life and her witness. So I'm, I'm so proud of her and what she's done and who she is. And I'm glad to be here because I had the opportunity uh, to start my own life and work at a university, which uh, was great. I was living in Des Moines, Iowa, and I'd had these five children. Um, they kept coming. I don't know what I was doing, but they just kept coming. <laughs> and uh, suddenly, I thought, I, I have to go out into the world to change it for my children. I started doing that. But a job came open at the university. And I, I saw, I thought it was wonderful. It was the first time they had ever had a director of a division of women's programming. And I thought, I want to go and create everything for women that I've ever wanted in my life. So I went to apply for the job. And I want to tell you this, because I think this happens, and I'll talk more about it later. So I went over and applied, because the, you know I knew some people over there. And uh, all my friends looked at me, and they said, Murray, you're never going to get that job. I said, why? And they said, well, you don't have a master's, and you don't have a doctorate, and oh, for God's sakes. And of course, you know I got the job, of course. And uh, it was wonderful because I got the privilege of working with a wonderful dean like you have. She's so much fun. Uh, and I, I got the privilege of working with somebody terrific who said, Marie, anything you can get funded, you can do. And boy, did he just open himself up. So I, I went out and said, I will do this. And what happened that was interesting was because I didn't know what you couldn't do at a university, I just got to build the best and the biggest division of women's programming in America at Des Moines, which nobody could believe. So we would go to Stanford and we'd go to these other places and they would say, how did you do that? And I said, I didn't know you couldn't do that. <laughs> And, and of course, I got the dean in trouble with the university all the time, but mostly we got people brought to the university because what I did know is the university needed to be connected to the community. And it was a great lesson, and I want to tell you that because I will talk more later about how we give each other courage. But sometimes it isn't what, it isn't what you expect that actually gets you to the place you want to go or what other people expect of you. Um, I want to talk to you today, though, about this whole issue of the importance of women's leadership. I, I came to it, I got, I've had the privilege of doing wonderful work in my life, but I don't think I learned more than I learned through Take Our Daughters to Work. You do some work where you just really learn. And the first thing I learned through it was because it came out of the academy. It was research that came out of the University of Minnesota and came out of Harvard. And it was showing that something happened to girls and adolescents. It's when they, as AUW well knows, when they started to lose their sense of, of per voice and, and, and think that they were um, only known for their you know, body as their bodies were maturing and boys' bodies were maturing into strength. And girls started to not say things and started to turn into uh, less resilient people. And there was a cure for that. It was about having adult women and adult men around them that gave them a sense of resilience. So we, we worked for two years to find a way to do it. And I want to say something about this because it started with research. And we put the research out there. And for those of you who are researchers, the first thing I learned is that if you put research out that says something is wrong, it's really good if you can give people something to do about it because they actually don't want to hear it if you can't work out something. So we, we took the research around, people were like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's too bad, uh-huh. Although they did know something was wrong. But after a couple of years, when we came up with this simple program, which was take a girl to work. It didn't have to be your daughter, it could, it could be anybody's daughter, um, that you thought, it was a pre-adolescent girl, uh, take them to work. And of course, amazing programs sprung up all over the country. And it, it, just to tell you another small story about how life will treat you if you happen to get to do something good, and that is we didn't expect it to be big. We thought it was gonna be a little program in New York, and it got out in Parade Magazine. And before we knew it, it went around the country. And people were so hungry for something to do that they started wanting to do it in droves. And there were seven of us in a fax machine. <laughs> so we, calls came in. We put the answering machine in somebody's home. And the woman who answered the phone would say, take our daughters to work day. And the person would say, I'd like to speak to the workplace organizer. By the way, they thought we were big. 
So she would put the phone down and pick it up and say, workplace organizer. <laughs> That's the way it went. I mean, if you do innovative things, sometimes you just have to tap dance. And uh, it, I, I, I learned also about controversy. I don't love controversy. But the controversy of Take Our Daughters was always about what about the boys? And the minute the first well, little girl walked out of the workplace, the hue and cry went up, what about the boys? And uh, I have to tell you, I have sons and daughters, I care about the boys. And what was interesting though is the controversy around the boys actually made Take Our Daughters over the years the best boy program in America. Because <laughs> it really got people thinking about boys. It not only changed a lot what happened with girls in this country, but it actually got people thinking about boys in a different way. And I won't tell you all my experiences unless you want to hear them with boys, but it was important information. But this is the best thing I learned and what, what really took me to working on the issue of women's leadership. And I learned it from a little girl who came to work the first time we ever did the program. I, uh, you know, what, what they did all the time was when the programs were over in the companies, they would have the women who were the top people in the companies stand up in front and talk about how wonderful it was to work at their company. And so this woman who had had a 10 or 11 year old girl was standing up and Oh, it's so great to be at Brooklyn Union Gas and blah, blah, blah. And she finished her speech, and the little girl was in the audience. And she looked out at the little girl who, she said, are there any questions? And the little girl said, yeah. She had followed her around all day, right? She said, I noticed your job was boring. <laughs> and the woman said, well, perhaps it's a little boring. She said, well, didn't you ever want to do something else? And the woman said, well, well, actually, yes, she had. She said, well, what did you want to do? And she said, well, I had wanted to be a singer. She said, well, sing me a song. <laughs> and right there in front of this group that had never seen this woman as anything but a buttoned up executive, this woman belted out, memories like the corners. Oh, Lord. I started to cry. <laughs> I started to cry because all I could think of is, our daughters are watching us. Our daughters and our sons, I think, and they ask us what songs we have stopped singing and what parts of ourselves we leave out when we go out into the world every day. And they call us to bring that back. And I think that's what started me on the kind of journey about women's leadership because I thought in two ways. One, as a democracy, what what parts of us are cut off from active work in this democracy and power, but as individuals, how do we create institutions? How do we create places for people to be in this country, in these companies, in this world, where people can bring all of themselves into it because we need it? Um, I'll tell you one thing, and of course what occurred to me since I was at the Ms. Foundation for Women, and I had been watching women in this country create policies that and programs all over America that were changing things in terms of wages. They created the living wage campaigns. They were changing things around how health care was delivered. They were changing things about violence in their communities, but they weren't getting the places they needed to get because they weren't sitting in the seats of power to make that happen. It would bump up against the legislature. It would bump up against the city council or the county commission, and that would be it. And that's when I realized if we want a community, a country that sings all its songs and say, then we have to get enough women alongside men into power so that it really is that kind of community so we have more choices. I was very happy this last week at the Fortune Summit. There's a Fortune Summit they do every year and uh, all the powerful women are there and some of us too. And um, the, the ones that get listed on the list, doo -doo -doo -doo, and Warren Buffett was there. And I, I just, if you don't know Warren Buffett, you will because there's a bill named after him right now, the Buffett bill, uh, because he's trying actually as a millionaire to get taxed, which is an unusual thing for a millionaire to do. And uh, he was sitting up there and he was being interviewed and I loved it, he said, uh, you know, he said, Actually, it's an amazing thing that our country is as good as it is. He said, because think of it, we've only used half its people. We've only used half its people. 
Think about where we would be in a country if we had used the women of his country. And he said, you know, my sisters were smarter than me. My three sisters, they were smarter than me. They were loved as much as me, but they weren't expected. They weren't seen as people who would have that opportunity and would take that opportunity. And I was like, duh, duh, duh. I told him, I said, nobody should be rich and smart and funny and say the right thing. I mean, he really, I was so glad. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. Not women going into the workplace or uh, going into power or into Congress to take the place of men, but to lead alongside them so that we really change things so that people can bring themselves in. Well, I'll tell you the good news and the bad news about this. The, the, the hard thing about it is that in this country, this country likes to think of itself as a fair country. And so the hard thing is that actually most people think this is already done. They think that women lead everywhere. Um, and the good thing is that it's the time that women are going to get to lead. Uh, so let me tell you why. Let me start with this. This, and this is for you. This is your generation. This is your generation. This is an enormous different period in the life of our country. You are living in an enormously different time. What's happening right now, uh, I think of always as a man that po possibly many of you have never heard of, and that's John Nesbitt who wrote a book called Megatrends. In Megatrends, Nesbitt wrote, and this is the thing I think he was most known for, that you have to know the business you're in the time you're doing it. And he wrote about the railroad business. He said, you know, the railroad business failed. You know why it failed? It thought it was still in the railroad business. But it wasn't. It was in the transportation business, a much bigger business. And it failed. It never has really recovered. And what I think of now is I think about this business we're in and why it is time to bring women in is that we are not in the gender business anymore. We're not just here talking about women's leadership, you know, gender, men, whatever. We are in the transformation business. That's what's happening now in this country. It's the transformation business. And so it is time, and it is happening, that a diverse group of people, particularly women, are coming into power all over the world. Um, I, I could tell you a million reasons why you're in the transportation, or the tra well, we are in the transportation business, not too well yet, but in the transformation business. But I think the, uh, I, I could tell you all the statistics that women now are trusted at the same level as men are more to run things in almost every aspect of leadership. I could tell you about Norway and all the European countries who are putting women on boards you know, have, have, are actually using quotas. I'm trying to get our country to think of it like, if we said we were doing quotas, could we do it? You know, <laughs> if we didn't call it quotas, would we do it? No, they're using quotas to get women on board. I can tell you things that are happening, but I think some of the most amazing things recently that say how the transformation business is coming along is who won the Nobel Peace Prize this last week? Three. Women! <laughs> Three women won the prize that we are struggling with in our, our world, how to have peace. Three women run that prize. It is just astounding. We are in the transformation business. And I want you to think some with me, because I want to talk about this a little more, about these women, but particularly one of them, because she's the one that I think is best il illustrates how different who succeeds is going to be. Lema Gabawi won the prize. She won it uh, for her work in Liberia. She had been somebody actually reintegrating child soldiers back into, you know, into the country of Liberia. But of course, it was a 20-year war. It was a horrible war. It was a terrible dictator, Charles Taylor. And what she did, I don't know how many of you have seen the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. But that documentary tells her story. She was a mother. And she said, this can't keep happening. And so she got the Christian women together and the Muslim women together. She put them together as a group and said, we will call for peace. Now, I, I don't think any of us in this room can imagine how outrageous that was. I don't know if we can imagine these mothers who had seen the soldiers come in and rape them, rape their children, take their sons, kill their husbands. This was Charles Taylor. It was a massacre in that country. 
And the women who did this had mostly lost things, but they gathered together and they put on white and they went out there and they sat in the side of the road and they sat in the markets. They walked miles with children. They sat every day and they said, we want peace. We want peace. They eventually got to the meetings. Lama talked to Charles Taylor himself. They surrounded the men at some point with their whiteness sitting there saying, you will vote for peace. And when the men said no, one thing they did that keep, people keep reminding me is they did with whole sex. <laughs> we should think about that. <laughs> but you know, I digress. And, but the other thing they did was of course, they were outrageous. We have to be more outrageous, by the way. Gloria Steinem, who I worked with for years, used to say, do one outrageous act every day. I say do three or four because we need it. But at any rate, they were outrageous and they, and they said, we will take off our clothes. Now, in that culture, it was the worst thing you could do because to see your mother undressed was like, oh my God, don't undress here. <laughs> I mean, they were outrageous, but they were amazing. And you know what? Ellen Johnson Sirleaf got elected, who is the, one of the other winners of the Peace Prize, partially because they brought this war to an end. I want you to think about who, is the, who are the people now, and I'm talking to men and women in this audience, who are the people that are gonna make this change in an area of transformation? And I want you to think about it too with regard to who just died recently, which is Steve Jobs. I mean, I want you to think about expertise. Is expertise usually the thing that does it? I don't know, sometimes I think our experts have failed us. You know, but Steve Jobs didn't have the expertise to do the job. He was not even an engineer. He was not an engineer, but he created products that actually changed our world, right? Because he knew how they should look and how they should feel and how they should work and what we wanted them to do. They do much more than I want them to do. My son is the cult of Mac. So now I am a Mac user. And I am a part of the cult of Mac. And I wish they didn't do so much. <laughs> but that he changed everything. But why was he able to do that? He did it because his motto was, think different. Think different. That's what I want you to think about as we talk about women's leadership and leading alongside men and bringing our whole selves in. Think different. When we created the White House Project, we did it because we thought we needed more people thinking different. You know the research now that Scott Page has put out all over the country and the world is that thinking different, thinking different is actually getting you to a better decision, having difference at the table, difference by race, difference by gender, difference by ability, difference by age, gets you a better decision than a group of experts. Difference matters, the world is too complicated. We cannot have a world any longer where in this country we have not changed the number of women in Congress over a period of, like since 1992. Come on, this is amazing. How could we, the leading democracy, be hovering at 23 and 24% of Congress for this, I mean, not Congress, but the state legislatures this long. Oh, in Congress, it's worse. It's, it hovers between 16 and 17%. It is outrageous. How can we have a school like this where I'm sure that more women will graduate than men from this school eventually? Most colleges do. But you will not have changed, in spite of your powerful people here, you will not have changed the number of women college presidents in America in 10 years, 20 years. 500. I mean, you have to think different. And so you can't leave out half the people. I could go on. You can't have 15% of the women in the law firms, 2% African American women, women of color. You can't have the lack of diversity we have and succeed. And so I am telling you, think different and think difference because men and women, you are going to want to be together. And it works to have men and women together because we do think different. I've been studying neuroscience lately. I'm not a great scientist, but I've been studying like that there are differences in the brain. I really tried to acknowledge that. I didn't want that to happen, actually. <laughs> I thought it wouldn't be a good idea, but actually women and men's brains are different. 80% of us have a kind of gendered brain. And what's interesting about it is they work together. Men's brains usually, when a problem comes up, go straight to the problem. Ba -da 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 -da. <laughs> Women's brains, when a problem comes up, 
often do not go straight to the problem. Some of us have mixed brains, but that's all right. My brain goes, I can feel it, you know. It's circling the problem, you know. And God knows the men in my life say, just get to the point. But, you know, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about this aspect and this aspect and this aspect. And I learned, by the way, that the corporate women that I know told me that long ago they learned not to talk about the do 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 stuff. But I didn't get the message. Um, you know, it's really important, though, to have people who are circling the problem and thinking of every aspect as, we, as well as this. And girls and young women and men and boys who are in the audience, I do want you to know that the funniest thing I've learned about this and the thing that may help you in your relationships the most is that um, anthropologists now tell me that boys' brains, men's brains, rest. I couldn't believe it, a brain that rests. And she said, well, you know, women were in the hut doing the work and they had to do the children and the men were out there standing behind a tree waiting for something to hit with a rock. <laughs> I never occurred to me. Men's brains rest. And women, I don't know how you feel about that, but I am jealous. I'm so jealous, but it has helped my relationship so much because I spent half my life saying to men, what are you thinking? And they said, nothing. <laughs> well, it went on. I got madder and madder. I know you're thinking something. <laughs> you have to be thinking something. No. And finally, it really is a relief to know that they're not. Um, and I am jealous. But we are learning that there's collaboration in the thing. It's not about one over the other. It's like having things that work together. But what we know we need in the world so desperately right now are people who da 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 but who have, because they have been at the foot of the table, which is women, and we have not had command and control leadership, have had to learn different things too. We have had to learn to bring people together like Lema did. We have had to bring people together to change power. We have had to work across difference because we have, we have not had that kind of power. We have learned some things that the world now needs very badly. And that's why we are going to have, as I am speaking on in Italy next week, Gorbachev is having something that's usually all men and it's having something about women. He says it's a century of women. I'm gonna go blog, I'm gonna join. But I'm going to get to speak on leadership as a duty for women, not just to write, because it is the real time. Well, what do you do when it's this time? I mean, this is what we've been doing at the White House Project, by the way, for the last several years, uh, is just working it every way to try to get women in. I mean, to a great extent, we have now trained, and I'm very proud of this, because we've been going around trying to get numbers of women in political office by training 10 and 20 at a time. We've trained 11,000 women in the last five years to run for office. And that, thank you. And they have been, 75% of them are under 35, which is when you have to run to get to the top. Half of them are of different racial ethnic groups than white. I mean, we are getting people to run for office and get in, and I'm very pleased about that. But what we have done is try to use the things that are important for your life. I mean, it's not, <laughs> Politics is great because it teaches you uh, in a very public way what everybody needs to learn, if you know what I mean. For instance, I've learned more about the need for women to have more ambition. We need to have more ambition. And it's hard to have ambition as a woman. It's a little frowned on sometimes. But it's so important for women to keep that. Anna Fels wrote a great book about how women have deferred the dreams they had when they were young. If you want, it's a great fun for you to read because they get squished down. And then, of course, women get so scared about ambition that when they go to negotiate stuff, as my best friends who are negotiators who write about it tell me, that even when women negotiate, you know, when they negotiate tough like men do, it doesn't work because unless they're relentlessly pleasant about it, <laughs> they don't get what they need to get. So you have to really hold on to your ambition. Um, and, and this is not because anybody's stopping you all the time. To a great extent, ambition has to do with what you see out there. Men look at men in office and they say, oh my God, most of them are in office. I could do that. They look in the mirror and say sometimes, don't they, men? I could do that. 
And, but not because they're bad, because they see other men there. It's just normal. And women have to be invited three times before they ever think about it. I've been having a fantasy since I met your dean. Have you ever thought about running for office? Governor what? Governor of Alabama. Governor of Alabama. <laughs> I can see this, by the way. At any rate, I've, I've been thinking about it. At any rate, what I've learned through politics is, do you know the research shows that three people have to ask a woman before she'll run? Three different people have to say, have you ever thought about this? I mean, it's just amazing. So uh, one thing that I have taken to doing in any session like this, by the way, because it's really important, I want to know, I want to know by a show of hands, um, because women stop leading, by the way, at college. That's when they start dropping out of leadership. They lead in high school, they lead in elementary school, and then they stop running for the class president or whatever. I, you don't have to say who, but by a show of hands, I want you to think about this a minute. I want you to think if there are any women that you know that would make a good president of their class. Any women that you know that would make a good president of the school, for that matter, but a good president. Do you, can you think of people? Raise your hand. Aha! I knew it. So you know them. All right. Well, I've been doing these kind of things for quite a while now, and uh, I have magic powers. <laughs> so if you don't, in the next 24 hours, tell somebody that you've seen her as a leader, and you think maybe she should consider taking a leadership position and tell her what it is. If you don't do that, something awful will happen to you. <laughs> because it's the only way I've found to get people to really, really take seriously that you have to go in and do this. Ambition is really the, the, the first thing that I ran across it when I started the White House Project was nobody was, we, we started with the presidency, by the way, because it's the one place that you don't have to fight with people about we've never been one, right? So, uh, so we put out a, a ballot, uh, probably 1998, about 20 women who could be the president, 20 women who could lead the country. And we put university presidents on it. We put lots of different powerful women. We put corporate women on it, people who could really lead the country. And my friends went crazy. They were like, oh my God, it went out in Glamour and Latina and Essence and Parade and all these magazines. I mean, because we wanted to get people thinking and voting and doing all this stuff. And we used, it was kind of before social media, right? But it was social media. And my friend said, Marie, that, did you ask these women before you put them on that ballot? I said, no. <laughs> I mean, why would I ask the president of the University of Pennsylvania if she wanted to be on a ballot. No. And they said, they are going to be so embarrassed. I, oh my God, I never thought about that. Would they? And sure enough, we put the ballot out and, and before it went out and all these things, I, I got to call them now. So I called Dr. Mae Jamison, who's the first African-American woman astronaut. I'd never met her. And I said, Dr. Jamison, my name is Marie Wilson and blah, 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 blah. And I put you on a ballot of somebody who could lead America, who could be a president actually. And she went, oh, that's great. <laughs> I called Judith Roden, then the president of the University of Pennsylvania. We put you on a ballot. And I just, oh, what an interesting way to do it. That sounds good. It kept going like that, let me tell you. <laughs> really, almost everybody but Marion Wright Edelman who said, Marie, I don't want to be the president. I said, no, you don't want to be the president. I just put you on a ballot, OK? But at any rate, everybody said yes. Do you know the only calls I got after that, the only people who had any emotion about that at all were like, why am I not on that ballot? <laughs> yes. Because it's not that women don't want to lead, but we are not, not enough of us out there to really feel comfortable that you can. By the way, it is why women are leaving the workforce. They tell people they're leaving because they have children. They can't afford to leave when they have children. Come on. They're leaving because they don't see enough women up there. Seeing women is really important. So we have to really fuel each other's ambition. And young women here, this is something I want you to really think about doing. One way I have found to fuel this, as well as confidence, that I want to talk just a little bit about later, is that I want, in, in, when we train women to run for office, we set them down and we say, who's your five? And what we mean is, who are the five people that see you 
that you believe will tell you the truth, that you believe will encourage you, give you courage, and that you trust. Who are your five? Because you're not going to run unless you've got five. This is what we need in life all the time. All of us need five people around us. And it's not a board of directors, you know, oh, 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 no. It's five people that you can talk to about your dreams and hear theirs. It's five people that will tell you the truth. It's five people who will encourage you. And it's five people who will discourage you when you're thinking too small. I'm really, really, one thing I'm really pleased about is being one of the five for a woman named Abigail Disney, who is indeed a Disney of the Disneys, right? I, I've known her for years, and she called me one night a few years ago, and she said, so-and-so is asking me to do an endowment campaign for a prestigious and blah, 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 blah. I said, don't do it. She said, Marie, it's a da-da-da-da. I said, don't do it. <laughs> I said, you have more to give. You have more to give. And I'm so excited because not only did she make the film Pray the Devil Back to Hell that got the world to know about Leigh McGovey who, run, who won the Pulitzer Prize, but she has made a five-part PBS series that started this week on women, war, and peace. One of the biggest series. She found her Disney-ness. <laughs> but the important thing is I, it's very hard, but you've got to have people who not only encourage you, uh, to do things, but discourage you from thinking too low. So I challenge you to have those people around you because they will also give you confidence. And by the way, I went to Chicago this year and somebody had a little dinner for about four women in Chicago uh, that get together all the time. They have top positions there and they're always sitting there thinking about what to do for each other to get to the next level. We're going to get you to be this. We're going to get you to be this. We, think about that. What if all the women in this country had four women and were thinking about how to get each other to the next level? I mean, come on. All of you are young enough to have those people around you now. You could start that. But at any rate, um, learning, to, learning to actually use people. There's an article in The New Yorker, by the way, that talks about, uh, do I need a coach? Does everybody need a coach? And I loved it. It was a great surgeon who wrote it, a terrific surgeon. He said, I'm not getting what I should. I need a coach. I mean, all of us need a coach, but we need like five coaches. But the other thing that these people can give you is confidence. One thing that has so struck me is that I thought, I, I meet women that I think are completely confident. I mean, I look at them and I think, God, they walk out in the world. I'm not completely confident. Where did they get that? Confidence is something that we have discovered in terms of getting women to lead, that it's what we have learned to do with women. Anybody can teach you skills. Anybody can teach you skills. But you have to have a way that you get people to have confidence. I was shocked. I first heard this from a woman named Mo Malum. Mo Malum uh, died. Of a, of a brain tumor, but she was the British Parliament member who actually uh, did the, uh, the peace process in Northern Ireland. She negotiated the peace process. She was an outrageous woman. Oh my God, she grew up working class, she went to school, she got elected to Parliament. She would, she would sit down with the leaders. And what was so interesting, though, is that she had a brain tumor. Everybody that met her used to come back and say, well, you've got to meet Mo Ball. And so when we had something at the press club that was why women matter and had a lot of other people, from women from other countries who'd done things and had Madeleine Albright, it was a big fancy affair. I thought, Mo Mullen must come. And sure enough, Mo Mullen came. The only problem was she and Hillary were great friends, so she went to see Hillary first that morning. She spilled coffee on her in the cab. And so she came in and she looked like, I wish I could look. She was so disheveled, she walked up to the microphone and I could see people out in the audience going, oh my God, who is that? <laughs> Jesus, oh my goodness. And she stood and then she started to talk. And then she, I, she was so good that Tony Blair, when he stood up after the Irish peace process was negotiated, people went, <coughs> when Mo Malum stood up, they stood up and yelled and screamed because of her bravery, because she sat down with the leaders, because she had so much guts. But she beat on the podium that day, and I will never forget, it was before we did training, and she would go, confidence. And I thought, what in the world? And now I have learned how much we need confidence. Uh, I work with Rutgers, and Debbie Walsh at Rutgers told me a story about once, the, uh, once um, they called a woman to be on the Asparagus Commission. 
and uh, yes, in the state of New Jersey, and when Christy Todd Whitman was governor, and they called her and they said, she said, you know, I grow asparagus. I like asparagus. I eat asparagus, but I don't know enough about asparagus. I mean, think about it. I don't know enough about asparagus. Oh, come on. I mean, this is the level of of a confidence that kills me. So we we need. <laughs> We need confidence, and why can't we have confidence right now? You pick up the paper, and you see who is leading the monetary solutions in the world, and it's a woman from France, Christine Lagarde. And now I know I can call her Angie. I have permission, Angie Merkel. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's the woman president of Germany. It's the woman who's leading the World Bank. We can have confidence. Moving right along, we really have to help each other with authority. I mean, women need authority, and we don't feel like authorities, and people don't always see us as authorities. I think that's why Madeleine Albright used to wear those big pins around, like, I am the leader here, I am the Secretary of State, listen to me, you know. Because I don't think she, I think she walked into lots of rooms where they'd say, I'd have a cup of coffee, please. Not I am the leader. So at any rate, you know, it's, we don't have authority in the world, so we have to authorize each other. We have to introduce each other in ways that authorize each other. I have a friend in New York that I always love because when she introduces me, she'll take my hand and she'll start talking. I get embarrassed, but she'll start talking and say, this is Marie Wilson, and she'll start saying what I've done. And I thought, God, by the time she's halfway through, I'm like, I really want to know myself, you know? <laughs> And that's the way we need to introduce each other in the world and to think of each other in the world because we need to authorize and we need men to authorize us. It is wonderful to have men like Warren Buffett say, I really think we gotta have women in leadership. We need male allies, make allies of the young men here and men make allies of the woman because remember your brains rest. <laughs> You'll need them to be doing things while your brains are resting. But at any rate, um, authorization is important, and a part of that authorization comes from the media, comes from being seen, comes from being visible, because it's who gets known. Uh, Marion Wright Edelman also used to say, you can't be what you can't see. You cannot be what you can't see, and if you don't see enough women, there's now a film called Misrepresentation that you should bring to campus if you haven't. Oh, good, you have, okay. No, yes, but it's wonderful because it's made uh, to show how the media starts to depict women in ways that they lose authority, that they actually don't see the things they could be. And by the way, there are some new television programs out there that while they are about international crime and local crime and et cetera, have some great tough female leaders, so things are looking up. But that whole area of being seen is really important being noticed, you have to put each other out in the, in the paper in the school. You have to actually figure out how people come in who uh, build, build on the, in the notion of women's leadership. Um, I have been outrageous about this. I was lucky, I had a, a friend uh, who died recently named Wilma Mankiller. And Wilma Mankiller was the chief of the Cherokee Nation and I had never I had never actually met a, a Native American chief. I was so excited. I moved to New York in 85, 86, and she came to New York, and I was like, I went rushing over there because I thought, this is great. And I walked in, and the men were huddled along the sides of the wall. And I went over, and I said, what is going on? And they said, well, my man killer is here. I said, she doesn't look armed, but God, what do I know, you know? I mean, you know, so there, and she stood up, but she was a, a very brave woman and amazing. And she stood up and she really knew two things. She said, I just want to reassure you that my real name is not man killer. And so there was this, it is white man killer. <laughs> and I will never forget it because she knew what was going on in the room. She said there, you know, and so she just disarmed it with humor. She disarmed it with humor. I mean, which humor is a great thing in a movement. Learn to laugh and be with people who are funny. If they're not funny, try to figure out why they're around you. Because <laughs> you really need in tough times to have people who have some sense of humor. But not only that, she knew that you start where people are. And so when we did the White House project, I was lucky. I, uh, I actually had to raise money, which is a hard thing to do. And by the way, if you can raise money, you can do anything in life. But I went over to Mattel, and they wouldn't give me money. And I was very upset because, uh, 
you know, I needed it so badly. And then they said, I said, well, you should just make that doll a president in the White House. You could, you could make the dream house into a White House and should have something to dream about. I was mad. And they said, what a great idea. And I went, oh, no, you're going to make a, like they, made my, they made Mattel White House President Barbie. Yeah, this is why she will come out her fourth time this year. And then I thought about it. I have all these children. They had Barbies. Most of the time, they were lying around the floor naked, you know. And when you dressed them, they were princesses. Why not have her be a president, right? I got really brave about it. And then I thought about what Mel Wilma used to tell me. You start where people are, Marie. And so I started working on television, movies. We were the ones behind Commander-in-Chief for those brief six weeks it was on. You know, we tried to get... You know, media matters. Doing things outrageously sometimes matters, but getting people visible matters. Having women on television that are actually authorities matters. Um, but you have to be, you in a college, you have to get people seen, and that's important. And finally, I have worked a long time to figure out how we have women trust their ability. <laughs> How he has them trust their ability. I, I, when I first started working and re writing this book that I wrote, Closing the Leadership Gap, I wrote down the first sentence I wrote is, when will the world trust women and when will women trust themselves? Because trusting in your abilities, that's why I'm talking a little bit about you don't always have to be an engineer to change the computer in industry. I mean, you should get an education. Thank God some of us did. But you don't have, you can be outside of that, you know? Women's abilities have been narrowed in this country. Culturally, it's never changed. The image of women in America is still of wife and mother. Well, wife and mother, that is still the cultural image. And it's a great image. I have chosen it a couple of times. <laughs> but it's really not all. And if we want to change the world for our children, then it has to be beyond that, because what women have done in leadership, how they have collaborated, how they have brought people together, the, the skills that they have, as one of my friends wrote from Simmons College, Joyce Dudley, often turn into mothering and not into leadership. I want to tell you women, those are leadership skills. I mean, it's the only way that decisions are going to be made that are good, and you are going to have some hard decisions, because the Human Genome Project, what we're learning about that, is going to make this world more complicated than the computer industry ever was. Because the ice cap is melting, the world will be more complicated. And so it's important. And how are we going to do this? I just want to say one thing. I'll tell you one story and end. We're going to do it by sticking together. Everything is set up for women to be divided. Everything is set up for women to be divided because keeping us divided is what keeps us from power. And I want to tell you the last story. We had an International Women's Leadership Summit bringing 88 world leaders in to see how we could shift the security paradigm. And um, the woman that, one of the women that spoke from Rutgers, uh, from the Carr Center, told the story that I will never forget. She said, you know, in Rwanda, uh, during the massacre there, during the uprisings in Rwanda, uh, there was a girls' school with 12 year old girls, uh, Tutsi and Hutu girls, and the rebels came into the school and they looked at the girls and they said, Divide yourselves! And the girls were terrified, as you can imagine, and they started whipping the machetes around and they said, Divide yourselves! And the girls kept looking at each other, you know, because Tutsi, Hutu, Tutsi, Hutu, Tutsi, Hutu. Divide yourselves. And finally, the girls looked at each other, and one of them told, the, told the, uh, the rebels, we will not be divided. We will not be divided. Twelve-year-old girls, we will not be divided. And I started again to think, God, if 12-year-old girls with machetes flying can figure out a way to be as brave as to tell people they won't be divided. Surely American women can figure out in our groups and whatever how we are working together, how we work together. Um, they were tortured, they weren't killed. They were tortured, they weren't killed. The women of South Africa have stood up to the men when they first got the vote and said, we want actually to have 30% of the seats of the African National Congress and the men said no. And the women said, we want 30% of the seats. And the women, the men said, no. The women got together and said, we will have 30% of the seats of the African National Congress or we will vote against you. 
The men said, okay. <laughs> That's why the world is changing. That's how Norway started a movement that is now getting 30% of the board seats dedicated to women, because women won and stayed together. I thank you for coming out on a rainy day and for your attention and for the fact that you're here and are going to take on all these things and, and you were cared enough to come, so thank you very much. Thank you.